Welcome to the 2017 Highlands Latin School Community Lecture Series. This annual lecture exists to promote the academic and aesthetic values of the Christian West. It also exists to energize and compel young people, especially the students at our school, to apply themselves in the urgent need to think and act in accord with a classical Christian worldview. At this annual event, a variety of speakers have delivered lectures about education, literature, theology, and philosophy. Sometimes our lecturers have bridged the disciplines. Tonight's speaker is no different. This year, our guest speaker is Mr. John Granger. Mr. Granger is a writer and lecturer whose compelling ideas on literature, theology, and philosophy have received a wide audience. His literary analyses, most notably on the Harry Potter books, have challenged readers to read deeply and with their whole minds. Mr. Granger is the author of many books, including Looking for God in Harry Potter, Harry Potter's Bookshelf, and The Deathly Hallows Lectures. Indeed, he was called the Dean of Harry Potter Scholars by Time Magazine. And although Mr. Granger writes at the website hogwartsprofessor.com, he does not write just about Harry Potter. Rather, Mr. Granger writes and speaks about other popular books and a wide variety of topics. His expertise has seen him invited to lectures at fan conventions and Princeton University. Mr. Granger is a graduate of Phillips Exeter Academy, the University of Chicago, and Oklahoma City University. Like many of our students, he studied Latin and Greek. Even with all that, he somehow found the time to serve our country in the United States Marine Corps. He and his wife, Mary, have seven children. Tonight, Mr. Granger will speak about truth and beauty and some Harry Potter. Please join me in welcoming him to HLS. He's actually a very nice man. Gosh. And my glasses, I'm gonna go speak the line. I, let, me, let me answer the, the first, the, the three questions I'm always asked at a speaking event. Um, is Dumbledore really gay? No, he's an alchemist. Have you ever met J.K. Rowling? No, I haven't met J.K. Rowling. She doesn't spend time with Potter parasites. And three, how did you get this gig? How did you become the Dean of Harry Potter Scholars? Um, and that's actually, that's, that's a good story. And this is about stories tonight, so let's talk about it. Let's give it a story. Uh, I was living in Houston. I was working for Whole Foods Market. I was, I was the, uh, the token uh, Marine veteran, heterosexual, Christian. I, I, I satisfied all of Whole Foods Market's diversity requirements in one person. Um, it's only funny if you know Whole Foods Market, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was their metro trainer. And a woman there told me I had to read Harry Potter because it was about a boy who studies to become a wizard. And I said, we don't, we don't do wizardry in, in Orthodox Christianity. <laughs> and, and, and she said, I, I'd never heard of Harry Potter. It was 2000, and, and I lived on a seven-acre uh, <laughs> uh, property with a couple other homeschooling families. No radio, no television, no internet. I was living on the planet Zeno, so I had no idea this, anything that Harry Potter was going on. But because this woman with orange hair and a tattoo on her neck and something through her cheek was telling me it was a great thing I had to read, I was saying, I can do without that. Um, well, um, Harry Potter came, even though I told my wife about it, my wife said, oh, it's sold everywhere. It's sold in gas stations. Um, and she didn't want it in her house because she's a snob. She's, anything that's that popular can't be good. Someone smuggled it into my house. Our pediatrician gave it to my oldest daughter, who was just at that age, 11 years old. Um, <laughs> and I, I took the book from her and said, uh, I'm going to read this book tonight. And tomorrow morning, I will explain to you why we don't read trash like this. And I guess you know the end of the story. I, I mean, I, I, I read the book and thought, this is the greatest thing. Um, and why do they call it Sorcerer's Stone? There's no sorcery in here. Um, fast, fast forward, I moved to the Olympic Peninsula. 
out with the, out with the vampires on the on, out by Forks, and uh, I went to a C.S. Lewis Society meeting, and all the guys there were saying horrible things about Harry Potter, and I said, guys, this stuff is great. They said, why don't you give us a talk on that, Mr. New Guy, about how great Harry Potter is. So I gave a talk there, which turned into three talks at the Carnegie Library in town, which was filmed, and then the, the cable guys trade tapes, and all of a sudden, I'm on television in Portland and Spokane and these places, and the word starts going out that somebody says that Harry Potter, the gateway to the occult, is actually stuffed with Christian content, and that's why it's so popular. And seemingly overnight, I go from yurt sower and part-time Latin teacher to the dean of Harry Potter scholars. Um, to answer, answer the question, how do you become the dean of Harry Potter scholars? You don't. That's, I, that's, there's only one way to get there, and I, I found it. Um, you're, you're stuck. Um, anyway, stories, stories, stories. I should tell you, when my, when I got the next, when my, my daughter got up the next morning, and she came out with her little bunny slippers to, fi to find out the bad news about trash like this and why we don't read Harry Potter. <laughs> I said to her, I've got good news and I've got bad news. I imagine the right children all know this. You know, great, not only do I get to get the news I don't want to hear, I get a cute lecture with it. And I said, the, the, the good news is you get to read the book. And she snatched it out of my hand. And cynical, jaded 11-year-old that she was, she looked through it to see if I'd torn any pages out of it. <laughs> I'm not that, I don't tear pages out of books. And she, so she's kind of, you know, looking around. I said, the bad news is, it's so good, you have to read it. And she looks at me with this little smile like, Dad, this is some weird attempt at reverse psychology. Absolute fail. You know, she goes into her room and locks the door to her room. And hence, we started the Harry Potter adventure. All right. More stories than maybe you wanted to hear. Um, one more story. One more story. I, um, I was a junior in high school, and my parents decided they were going to move. And um, I, they didn't want to send me to the local high school in Pennsylvania where we were moving. They were moving. And so they asked if I wanted to go to a prep school. I'd never heard of prep schools. Um, fortunately, I was a National Merit Scholar, so they all wanted me to help to get you know, grant money and such. And I wound up at Phillips Exeter Academy, which um, was easily the, the worst year of my life which is to say I've had a very soft life. Um, even the six years in the Marine Corps didn't compare to that. Anyway, uh, they had an assembly almost every morning at Phillips Exeter. And they brought in speakers from around the world. It was, I mean, they've, they've got a billion dollar endowment. Phillips Exeter is older than the United States. And if you haven't heard of it, it's all right. It's, it's been a feeder school to Harvard since, almost since there's been a Harvard. And most of the time, the students sit there and read the Boston Globe and be disrespectful. Now I'm sure they go through their phones and, and such. But um, this spe only speaker I remember the whole year of great programming was a man who came in from Michigan who got an award at his 50th reunion assembly for his, his uh, services to the academy. And it turns out he had been a one-year senior just like I was and he had been a loser. He had been a guy that hadn't made a very big impression at Phillips Exeter. Well, the guy was singing my song. There I was, just a small fish in a school of piranhas. And it was the only assembly I remembered. And I look back on that and think, what am I gonna say tonight that anybody in this crowd is gonna remember? Um, you students and such. Um, I hope I say something that's, that's, that's uh, topical enough that you'll get it. I, and I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical that any of you will, will find this. Because I'm, I'm basically, I'm going I'm to tell you to uh, fight the, the current, fight this tsunami. You know, s s go surf the tsunami. Um, one more story before I jump into this. About three years ago, I decided that I was going to, I, I'd just gone back to get my MFA and so I wasn't on the speaking, the, the speaking circuit, and I said, I'm going to not get into a car or a motorized vehicle, no motorcycles, no buses, nothing for as long as possible. I want to see if I can break out of 
this practice that defines really modern American understanding of space, the automobile. I'm not going to get in one. I lasted nine months and two weeks, basically a human gestation period. And I had to, it was a church thing I had to do in Arkansas, and I was, my wife's not going to drive that distance. Um, so I got into a car for the first time in nine months and two weeks, and there wasn't a single difference as if I had not driven since the previous day. Not a single thing. My ability to read the windows, shift the gears, not a spot of difference. What? <laughs> Why do, you, why do you think that is? I, I, that really stunned me, that I could get on a highway and, and have you know, all the skills for driving unimpeded after nine months of not getting anywhere near a vehicle. And the reason I couldn't was because I had never left a world that was entirely formed and about driving in a car. Even when I was walking to work and I walked or biked to work every single day, I was on the roads observing all the rules of the road uh, I was in a world that was on a grid of, of streets. And so I was absolutely inside the car mindset. I want to talk to you tonight about intellectual technologies and um, urge you to hold it at arm's length for a minute and, and examine whether it's something you want to have the, the relationship that you do have with it. But I want to begin the talk by saying it's probably naive to think you can get away from it any more than you can get away from a world of maps and uh, uh, phonetic alphabets and clocks. Um, I think the only way to get out of that world is a lobotomy. Um, we are so hardwired into this way of looking at the world by this intellectual technology and the internet and cell phones and such are doing the same thing to us. All right, now for the talk. Is that, was that enough of an introduction? All right. All right. Hey, I've already done all this. That's great. All right. The most important book that I've read in the last few years is Nicholas Carr's The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. I disagree with Carr's premise and more than a few of his conclusions, but I recommend it because it addresses the most important concern of postmodern life, the advent of the internet and other brain-altering intellectual technologies. I grew up in the 60s and 70s watching television my dad said that if the average American was watching three hours of television, I was making up for the Amish kids, keeping that national average up. Um, <laughs> that speaker I was talking about that I remember from high school almost certainly grew up listening to the radio for entertainment and distraction. And I thought he and I lived in different worlds. A man who grew up in the 20s and 30s versus a kid that grew up in the 60s and 70s. It turns out, of course, that we lived in the same pre-internet world and didn't know it. No matter how much time we spent with our primitive broadcast entertainments, we spent as much of our time with print media, with newspapers, books, magazines, super hom superhero comic books were my favorite, and school texts. They shaped our minds and thinking much as this new media had all Western minds since the Gutenberg press. In the shallows, in fact, Gutenberg, uh, Gutenberg Carr, Nicholas Carr, describes the pre-internet thinking as Gutenberg brain. And he argues that our exposure to print media for hours every day as children and adults made us think differently and understand the world better and more profoundly than we do today with our internet-shaped brains. To simplify his important and challenging argument, Carr asserts that the brain reshapes itself according to how it acts and what it attends to. You literally are what you think, at least your brain is. He draws on myriad studies of the last 30 years in the fields of neuroplasticity and cognitive psychology to make the case that the brain rewires itself rapidly and profoundly in conformity to its activity and focus. In brief, we choose what we watch and we think about but we become what we watch and think about and rebuild our brains to watch more of the same. Forgive me for assuming that most of you here have grown up with PCs, iPads, smartphones, and the like. 
it's difficult, given the ubiquity of this technology and your experience, to appreciate the There's a few gray hairs out there, though. I see you. <laughs> it may be difficult for those of you who are young to appreciate the change that these intellectual tools have made in our lives. Those of us who grew up with Gutenberg minds do not struggle to understand what Carr is saying. We know, if we think about how we think at all, that after any time working on the internet, that it is much more difficult for us to read than it used to be to read printed material of any length or depth. Reading that requires slow mining, as John Ruskin put it. Our brains, in brief, are as different in synapse function and relation from Gutenberg brain as that brain is from the brains and minds of pre-print cultures and post-intellectual technology brains are from those without clocks, maps, writing, and other intellectual tools that have literally remade and reshaped both how we think and how we are able to think. And that's, I mean, for those of you who are Christians, I want you to understand that the Gospels are written for a world in which the phonetic alphabet is largely stranger to most people hearing these, these, this good news, and that the world of clocks and maps are absolutely alien to it that the brains of the apostolic era Christians are, are <laughs> different than our brains in ways that can be mapped by any kind of brain scan in terms of activity and understanding. That's, 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 that's a, a, a subject for um, Christian soteriology that I've never heard anybody address. The internet with its indefinite number of web pages and near infinite access to instant information and answers via search engines is oddly enough, Carr says, making us stupid. Or at least relatively superficial or shallow thinkers compared even to Gutenberg brains of our recent past. I urge you to read Carr's book because what and how you think is who you are and he describes how the internet is remaking how and what you think. All right. But I'm not here to give you a sermon on cell phones. Uh, one of the mysteries of the internet brain is why we find surfing so addictive. Why do we spend hours on social media, news websites, and weblogs bouncing via hyperlinks from one quickly scanned page to the next? As this bouncing about and superficial skimming is redefining how our brains work and what we can understand, there should be a reason that we prefer it to slower, more thoughtful, relatively undistracted thinking. Carr is somewhat weak on this point, which is no great failing, especially in light of his brilliant exposition of decades of research about how our brains work and how the internet is reshaping how we're able to think. But still the question, why is this, is an important one. He describes surfing time as something like crack for the brain. The instant gratification and satisfaction we get in our internet searches and from our social media contact, like pornography and refined sugars, focus our brains, literally remaking neural pathways to get more of the same faster, which leads to further reshaping until we are very different people than we were pre-addiction to surfing and email scanning. That quite literally, just as a heroin or a crack addict rewires itself to get that pleasure that it had never known before. And the brain doesn't unwire that connection. That it, the suffering of, of addicts is largely a function of neuroplasticity. So when we get the, the stimulus and satisfaction from internet surfing, our brain rewires along that pleasure to get more of that pleasure. Superficial as it is. This, of course, only kicks back the question of why. Why do our brains find this information access and virtual contact with others so important and satisfying? To answer that question and to get to the subject of truth and beauty at last, we need to move to another subject area in the field of cognitive psychology, namely the one addressing the human need for story. That's why I started this off with all those stories. I'm, I, I, in my research, I found out that no matter what a lecturer says, the only thing you're taking home is the stories that I told. Um, you're gonna remember the guy who didn't walk, who walked for nine months, you know, in Oklahoma City. Um, you're gonna remember the story about the guy and his daughter with the fuzzy rabbit slippers. Um, all right, we tend to think of storytelling as entertainment. That is, as the less serious side of life, the icing on the cake, if you will. 
Um, social scientists and psychologists, however, think of man as homo fictus, the storytelling animal, and have found that turning information that we have from experiences and sense perception into narrative is not the icing on the cake, but the cake of human life. Uh, it is what our brains do all the time, waking and sleeping, what we have evolved and are designed to do. Our brain, mind, our identities are the sum of the story we tell ourselves about ourselves and which we believe. Jonathan Gottschall explains all this in his book, The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human. Story time is all the time. Not just the books we read, the movies we watch, the sports we follow slavishly, and the television shows and advertisements we turn into. It is our daydreams and our night dreams, our imaginative review of our past and our ideas of possible futures. Our lives are, as human beings are about discovering more stories and better stories and confirming those stories to the ones that we believe in already. That we can take any event in our lives and make it fit into the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. And I'm sure you have friends who say, how does he live with that? Well, because the mind is a wonderful storytelling machine. It's just a strange twist in the story. I think it is possible, even likely, that the internet and other intellectual technologies are as addictive and brain shaping as they are because they deliver story experience and content that we are designed to pursue more effectively, more rapidly, and more cogently than any other story delivery system in the history of the world. I just as, I'm going to break off from the side here. The, the, in, in the news cycle of the last two or three months, there have been two big events. One was uh, the Las Vegas shooting, in which 60 people were gunned down at, at a music festival, and the Harvey Weinstein drama. I like that face. That's good. That's good. Every woman in the room sort of rolled their eyeballs. Um, the Las Vegas shooting was an unsatisfying narrative in which the country was told, we don't know why he did it. We don't know that he did it. We don't know how it was planned. Basically, we were given the story ending, the shooting, and everything else about it is mysterious. This man has 20 guns inside his room. He has 20 more at home. And we don't know, and he winds up. It's, 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 the, it's the great cauldron of conspiracy stories, right? But all of us didn't have the satisfying ending. Oh, a terrorist group explained this. Oh, the guy had just gotten divorced. There, there, there was no story there that we could really latch onto and say, oh, he's this guy and put it into this niche in our minds. And in the wake of that story, literally really within you know, an hours in the, in the whole news cycle, all of a sudden a man in Hollywood who has been known for decades to be a predator on young women becomes the great demon and pariah of the age. I put it to you as a possibility that Harvey Weinstein rose in the news cycle as he did because he was a very easy story to understand who the villains were, who the good guys were, uh, and how we're supposed to respond to it and put it into our own lives and our own stories as, as men and women who have all seen events that roughly parallel the casting couch. I really think that news cycle gives us an idea of how important story is to our lives, how disturbed we were that Las Vegas didn't give us a story, and yet how Harvey Weinstein was the greatest story ever in that we could all say, bad man. Take everything away from him, destroy him, and reward everyone that's good, all the Me Too women that are, that are now coming out of the closet after all these years saying, yes, I was abused by men. Very satisfying story, easy to understand the, the good guys and bad guys. All right, sorry for the thing. <laughs> the internet as a satisfying story delivery system only kicks back the why question one more step. As Gottschall explains, there is a mystery of fiction that he both as an English professor and expert in evolutionary psychology, struggles to understand, and to which mystery, frankly, he offers only an unsatisfying answer to. Why are we designed for storytelling? What is the advantage to listening to and being distracted by story that gives story people a leg up 
in the natural selection battle to pass on our genes. Gottschall is an evolutionary psychologist who buys the entire evolutionary paradigm. Now at last we get to truth, beauty, and Harry Potter. Almost. <laughs> I mean, why are we all about story? So much so that our brains are being rewired and dumbed down in capacity because we spend so much time with intellectual technology like our smartphones, iPads, and PCs to get more stories, including the, basically the, the our story. I mean, all of us, all of us are in a soap opera. And, and we're the heroes because, David, we're in every scene, right? <laughs> I must be the star of the show. Um, and we all are walking through our lives telling these stories, and the internet gives us relationships with everybody as we go through this every day. Story is our primary means today, as it has always been, in fact, to have contact with what is most real and what makes us human. Ralph uh, Wood has spoken here. The Tolkien scholar at Baylor University puts it this way. Fantasy, he writes, is not our way of escaping from reality, but the best way we have of entering into it. To get at what that means, uh, I think three ideas we have to understand from Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, my hero. <laughs> uh, my favorite laudanum addict, addict at least, right? All right. <laughs> Ideas, these three ideas about what happens when we read, what imagination is, and how we know anything. All of which ideas turn our conventional thinking upside down. Coleridge famously asserted that entering story of any kind involves necessarily the suspension of disbelief, a suspension made in an act of poetic faith. This suspension means essentially the turning off of our critical faculties, our individual rational thinking. What is left when these lights go out, the brain mind of our schooling and upbringing and accidental mental baggage is what Coleridge called the primary imagination. Really our cardiac intelligence rather than our cranial individual intelligence. A transpersonal human faculty that is not ours. Now this is hard for us because we live in an age of rationalism and individualism. And we understand the world as each individual is sovereign uh, with their own individual wills that's distinct from everyone else. And that what marks this individual person, their highest psychic, psychological uh, faculty is their reason. Um, this belief, which is uh, characteristic of our age, is contrary to the five great revealed traditions and the animist religions. Um, every one of them, and to, to, to include um, uh, Christianity, at least Orthodox Christianity, uh, believes that there is a, uh, a faculty within you that is not really yours. And I suspect you all have, C.S. Lewis calls this the conscience. When he talks, he wrote an essay called uh, Onward, Christian spacemen, which, which was, you'll find it in anthologies as the seeing eye. Uh, I like the onward, forward spacemen better. But anyway, uh, he says that uh, the conscience is this faculty. And I think we all get that. Well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm unique in this audience for that. I mean, my conscience is always there too late. You know? My conscience is always there after I've said something stupid to my wife. Right there, as soon as I say it, the conscience says, oh, <laughs> that was a mistake. You need to walk that back now. And I say, where were you? Where were you before those words crossed the fence of my teeth? <laughs> it's not me. If it had been me, I wouldn't have been so stupid. But it's there. I have this sense of right and wrong and truth and beauty and justice that isn't something that I acquired. I may have a closer or more distant relationship with it, but there is this faculty. Different cultures and thinking call this faculty different names. The ancient called it the noose. The five great spiritual revelations of mankind to include Christianity call it the heart, the eye of the heart. But this is not a valentine or anything sentimental. This is what St. John calls the light 
that comes into the world in every man, a faculty of perception and discernment that is an aspect of the fabric of reality. In fact, C.S. Lewis says that the conscience is continuous with the fabric of reality, the logos that creates all things. Coleridge, though, calls it the imagination and says, primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. Basically that this conscience is the logos that creates everything moment to moment, the, the beneath, the behind, and the within which is also an aspect that we have, an uncreated aspect that is not ours as individuals, but is something that we each have access to as persons. Now, that's pretty hard for rationalists to get their head around, but I think it'll get you to the story thing. Let me get to it. Right. Coleridge asserts here that imagination is the root of and means to perception and knowledge because it is a reflection of, even coextensive with, the word or logos of God that brings everything into existence moment to moment. Within us, he says, is a capacity that is not mundane, but our link to the eternal and divine, the creative principle of the Godhead. This is what he calls the living power and prime agent of understanding, because it is the means by which we understand anything. Now, this, is, this gets tough. Coleridge tells us that all knowledge is the coincidence of subject and object. There's no way you got that. Right? I still look at that and think, what is he talking about? All knowledge is the coincidence of subject and object. Now, I don't think he was on a laudanum binge when he wrote that. that um, if you think about a mirror, a mirror is the only place in nature where we see the knowing subject and the known object are the same thing. Coleridge is saying all knowledge is like what happens in a mirror. That there's a coincidence of subject and object. And what he means by that is, I have this logos capacity within me. This, this uncreated faculty. Small lambda logos that's, that's continuous with the logos that creates all things. And... I look at this young man here and say, my logo says at least, if I've identified with it enough that I'm, that I look at him and recognize that what's bringing him into existence moment to moment, his metaphysical ground is identical to mine. I see the logos within him and recognize him as my brother in this logos. In fact, a fraternity which is greater than any biological fraternity because every one of you necessarily what is most real about you is what is most real in me. And if I see that, there's no way I can have any relationship with you except as the coincidence of subject and object. And it, he says all knowledge is like that because everything is brought into existence by this logos. And so my logos is seeing everything and seeing what type of logos it is. This is pretty dense stuff, I know. St. Maximus the Confessor is big on this, right? The, the Logi. But this idea explodes all idea of individualism and rationalism because what's most real about us isn't something our historical accidental selves really is about. It's sort of the front of those things. And that we all are epistemology, if it's not logos epistemology, is wrong. And you should know that the, the, the neuropsychologists and brain surgeons, they, they know where in your brain certain functions happen, but they don't know how you know anything. Like how you know French. They, don't, they, they may know what part of your brain French speaking grows up, but if they knew the actual chemistry of it, they could give you a drink and you could become fluent. But they don't have that. They don't know that. Lewis's, not Lewis's, Coleridge's understanding of this is actually... Um, the new advent in studies of, of soteriology and epistemology, this logos idea. Anyway, more than you wanted to know. Things I'm excited about. Right? The, the logos within us, in other words, perceives the logos within every created thing to include ideas and recognizes its reflection. Knowledge is recognition of the word by the word within us of a different aspect of itself. This logos faculty tied as, as it is to the beneath and the behind and within which of everything created the creative word is why Ralph Wood says that fantasy is not the way we escape reality but enter into it. We are designed for story, 
and we are seduced by the story, relations, and the virtual reality of the internet so profoundly because we are images of God precisely in that faculty and we seek it out in the stories we tell ourselves about the world and ourselves. That essentially this word within us is a storytelling, story-loving faculty. It's not a discursive mind. It's not a cranial intelligence. Those of you who are Christians, if you ever wondered why uh, the man who was entirely the word, toes to nose, not this fallen faculty that's broken with this, 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 this human beings that have a conscience but have a weird relationship with it, but a person who's just, just that conscience or imagination, why did he only teach in story? I, I offer it to you via Coleridge that the reason Christ only spoke in parables was because he could see your heart and realize that at least the heart was alive in your response to the stories because it's the faculty that responds to it. As you suspend disbelief in your individual faculties and poetic faith, your heart comes alive and can assume this truth. All right, Harry Potter time. <laughs> okay. oh. I spent the last 15 years thinking about pretty much one question, and that's... Why does the world love these Harry Potter stories the way that they do? And you, you need to know, that that's, 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 that is not just a goofy, geeky question. Um, Harry Potter has largely refashioned um, the expectation of stories of readers, writers, and publishers, and filmmakers, uh, that what happens in a Harry Potter story has become the new standard for at least three generations of people. Uh, what, what did Rowling do that was so profoundly right in terms of hooking readers' attention, that it had a global influence across creed, culture, gender, genre. I mean, this is the story of our age. Um, that's what I've been trying to figure out. Okay, the best answer that I've come up with is the Iliadi thesis. Iliadi in his The Sacred and Profane notes that in the secular culture, entertainments or story, especially reading, serve a mythic or religious function. In other words, in a culture like ours that's materialist, rationalist, individual, you know, individualist, story opens a window to a world that is greater than our ego existence the way liturgy and sacrament used to do in, in well, they still do in normal theocentric cultures. The Harry Potter stories are as popular as they are according to the Iliadi thesis because they, they do supremely well what we want all stories to do for us today. Because of the author's use of traditional symbol-laden storytelling techniques, namely literary alchemy, ring composition, and the soul triptych, we experience not only the heart's activation when we suspend disbelief, but also an immersion into, even an elision with, what Harry thinks and experiences as he is transformed in every adventure. I mean, how many of you either were people like I was that didn't want their kids reading these stories as the gateway to the occult? or were people that knew other people and you were told by friends, don't read those books, they're dangerous. I mean, you got, okay. either you're all very dishonest um, or you've been living on an island. I mean, when, when I started reading Harry Potter in 2000, you, First Baptist in Houston was having barbecues almost weekly where they burned Harry Potter books. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a different time. Uh, this was, this was bizarre for a couple of reasons, but the one that really struck me right away when I started reading the books, I didn't know the books. I, I went back to Whole Foods the next day and apologized to Tiffany, the orange-haired woman, and said, basically, I, I was judging your book by your cover. Um, you were right. I was wrong. Um, and then I, 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 went I bought all the books that, that were then the three books that were then available, and I started reading them when I could in my breaks at work. And they would come up to me and say, John, you're our token Christian. You're not allowed to read Harry Potter. You know, play your role. Know your role, John. And I was like, these books are really Christian. There's a ton of Christian content in here. What are you talking about? I'm like, John, okay, you as our token Christian are not allowed to break with all the Christians in Houston who are burning these books. You know, try a newspaper every, you know, six months, John. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. And the reason I was saying, well, I, you've got to be kidding me, was because my objection was from the title, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Sorcery is invocational magic, where you call down 
principalities, powers, and demons from the psychic realm. It is a universal taboo among every revealed tradition. This is not a Christian hang up, okay? The Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims, everybody's hung up on this one. Don't call in the demons. Pretty much a no brainer, right? You know, the demons don't answer, they're not answering your needs. They're lying to you. Don't do that to yourself. It's the false, the false thing. And so I saw a sorcery in the title and thought, oh, great, all Harry's going to do is going to, you know, say a few magic words, and all of a sudden a genie's going to appear or a demon. And I'm, I want to say to my daughter, see, trash. We don't read that stuff. That's stupid. We don't do that. If you've read Harry Potter, you may have noticed there is no invocational magic in the books. She changed the title from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone because Arthur Levine, her publisher in the United States, said that no American will buy a book with the word philosophy in the title. <laughs> She says it's the only thing she regrets in the entire course of the publication and the films but that she agreed to change Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone to Harry Potter and the Sorcery Stone. It may have been the, the, the genius, it may have been the thing that guaranteed her sales was it ignited the entire Potter panic in the culture war. Um, what kills me is, is that the magic in Harry Potter is incantational magic, which literally means harmonizing magic. Now, here's the part that's, that's, that's so funny, you know, funny not in ha-ha sense, but, you know, queer, is that for incantational or harmonizing magic to work, you have to have a Christian worldview. It, it really grows up out of Shakespeare and, 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 and Welsh history that, that becomes, informs the rest of English literature that if you say a magic word as an image of God, when the entire world is created by a word, if the world is made of speech, then a mage or a, a holy man speaking as an image of God will be able to harmonize with that fabric of reality by his spoken word and recreate it. Incantational magic in brief requires a logos cosmology to work. So all the objections about Harry Potter magic is that it's too Christian. I found that very frustrating, um, especially when, when uh, Christians begin to you know, tar and feather me uh, as I spoke about it. Anyway, uh, do you get that? The magic in Harry Potter requires we understand the world not as energy and matter, but as speech. Otherwise, spells are kind of stupid. Unless, unless maybe it's big bad wolf time, right? You know, I, oh, ah, I huff and I puff and I do I use a physical force and blow you down. But if it's really just the quality of speech and my character that allow me to harmonize with the supernatural creative majesty of God, then it's an entirely different thing. All right. Then there's the soul triptych bit in Harry Potter. Um, how many of you have read the Phaedrus of Plato? We're all, we're all these... Highland Latin people, you know, they've read, the, they're, they're the classical studies guy, you don't count, sorry, you know, right. uh, in the Phaedrus, there's the myth of the charioteer that has, it has a, a black unruly horse, and he has a, a white horse, and he rides this chariot, and it's, it's the beginning of, of what in literature is called the soul triptych, that an, an image of man as body, or the desires, the faculty of soul most attached to the body, um, and the, the will, which is also in, in the rational mind, and then this noetic or cardiac intelligence, this what we call the spirit. Fast forward through the, through the millennia, and you get uh, the brothers Karamazov, probably the greatest novel ever written. And the three brothers, somebody nodding their head, oh yeah, or no? Yeah, Dostoevsky, man, yeah. 10 points for Ravenclaw, I love it right there. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, the three brothers, there's, there's Alyosha, he's the heart. There's Ivan, he's the rational mind. And then there's Dmitri, who's absolutely nuts. He's totally desire-driven. Uh, and they talk about you know, the, the troika inside the, inside the novel, uh, the passions. It all comes down to, will they, will they listen to Alyosha, the kid brother, who's the heart? In, in popular culture, it's Star Wars. Um, I, I, it's really the Lord of the Rings first, right? On the three, the three hobbits on Mount Doom. You've got Gollum, who's the body. 
You've got Sam, who's the will. I'll carry you up the mountain. You know? And there's Frodo, the long-suffering, who, has, who bears the ring. Um, and you can tell that, that uh, Vatican I Catholicism that Tolkien is in, doesn't think much of the body, right? You're not looking at, at Gollum thinking, got to be like that guy. <laughs> Fast forward to Hollywood and Star Wars, and we see a different triptych where Luke Skywalker is the heart. Princess Leia is the will. Get out of my way, you walking carpet. Um, and Han Solo is the body. The body's looking pretty good now, right? The body's looking pretty sharp. Um, and then there's Harry Potter, where you have Ron, who's always looking for his next meal. He's afraid of spiders, and he's really not fit to do anything but carry the luggage for Hermione and Ron. And then there's Hermione, you know, who's Spock with long hair. Uh, Oh, there's also Bones and Spock and Kirk. Kirk means church. You know, that, that, again, we have body, mind, spirit. And Harry, you know, who has got, the guy who's got that saving people thing, the guy who lives on sacrificial love juice. This soul triptych is a large part of why this works in literature is you have, at least the Christian fathers tell us this, you have, you're an image of God because you have not only this cardiac intelligence, which is continuous with the word, but you have three faculties of soul. You basically have what the Bible calls the belly, um, which, is, which is the desires, the part that's most closely attached to, attached to the body. And then you have the epithemia, the, the, uh, you know, the will, um, and, which includes you know, individual intelligence or reason. And then you have this spirit, this, this, the heart, um, Lewis talks a lot about this in his book, David. He talks about the, the three-souled thing, St. Alanis. It's his book on education. I'm going totally blank here. C.S. Lewis scholars, help me out. That will come to one of you by, this, by later on. Anyway, th this, this is not something John's making up, this three faculty of soul. But the reason it's so powerful in Harry Potter is you read... Adelaide. Bingo. 20 points for Gryffindor. I love it. All right. Um, this... Um, <laughs> the reason this is important for Harry Potter is you read the story and as you identify with Harry, remember it's, it's your cranial, your, your cardiac intelligence, your heart, which is reading the story. And here's a character inside the books that represents, it, you really see the reflection of the faculty with which you're reading inside the book. Because if the world's right side up, it's the soul right side up, right? The, the, the heart is telling the, the will what to do, and the will is directing the desires. This snowman has to be in this order. And in Harry Potter, if Ron is doing anything but holding up the building, Ron is not doing well. When Ron decides in Goblet that Harry's made a mistake and goes on his own, it's miserable. I, I weep every time I read the Harry Potter adventure where the first try wizard attack where Ron comes back and apologizes I do I it must be a Granger thing I, I go absolutely I, I go absolutely weepy and why is that because the snowman turns right side up again and when Ron leaves in Deathly Hallows we see the same thing agony it's the most upsetting part of anything that happens in Harry Potter is when the trio are not in that right side up state because when we read Harry Potter our souls turn right side up and we rejoice in that. We live in a desire-driven culture where the Ron part of us is almost always in charge. If you doubt that, watch more car commercials on television, right? At the bottom of the car commercial, it will say 38 miles to the gallon. And then they have Paris Hilton on the hood of the car. It's not really appealing to your rational intelligence. I always said to my wife, look, 38 miles per gallon. She's doing the, no, that's not what this is about. It's not why you like that car. And last, there's the literary alchemy. Alchemy is entirely about this elision of subject and object that Coleridge talks about. Um, there's no way that alchemy works except that the alchemist is taking lead, which is hard darkness, not PB on the periodic table of elements. It takes hard darkness and turns it into solid light or gold. That idea of light and gold is about this light that comes into the world in every man. And the alchemist is looking for his own illumination and enlightenment. Those are the spiritual riches 
and the immortality he's looking for. And he's doing it in conjunction with the purification of this metallurgical aspect to get there. Literary alchemy is Shakespeare's realization that what he's talking about in terms of what happens in the lab happens on the stage. Whenever you're there watching a play, you see what's happening on the stage and you identify with it and what, what happens on the stage is what happens to you. So Shakespeare pours in metallurgical alchemical symbols into his stuff to make, to speed that process. That goes through all of English literature, really through C.S. Lewis. And then Rowling reinvents it. That's why Hermione has the name that she has. She's alchemical mercury to Ron's alchemical surf, sulfur. That's why he's, his middle name is Bilius. That's why Ron, uh, Hermione's first name is the feminine of Hermes. That's why her initials are HG. Uh, no chemists out there. Usually one person says, I got it. OK, I've got one joke there. OK. Um, it, it, it's why her parents are dentists. <coughs> mercury, dentists. This is a tough crowd. It's a rough crowd. All right. And really, it's, it's the death and resurrection in every novel. When you read Harry Potter, and we, we go through the circle of every journey and wind up in the, in the magical center space, and Harry confronts the bad guys, almost always underground, or after coming from the underground, he dies. It gets to the point in the fifth book where he says, so this is what it's like to die. And you think, oh, good, he's going to make it. Because he always makes it after he says, so this is what it's like to die. And he always comes back to life in the presence of a symbol of Christ. And as readers whose hearts are reading and, and identifying with Harry as that heart capacity inside the book, we have a, an imaginative experience of our resurrection. And we're transformed. Every year at Hogwarts features Harry's saving people thing, decision which results in his arriving at a mythic center where he dies a near death is sacrificed for his friends, from which death he rises in the presence of a traditional symbol of Christ. As ironic as it must seem, given the many Christians who object to the Harry Potter series as demonic or spiritually dangerous, it is precisely their Christian content, especially this imaginative experience of sacrificial love and symbolic resurrection we have with the boy who lived, that is the engine driving Potter mania. Tertullian tells us that all souls are Christian souls, which is to say that the Logos, light of the world, comes into the world in every man as his essence, whatever is professed beliefs. And the human soul thrills with delight in experiencing the Christian content of Harry Potter. Which brings us to truth, beauty, and reading fiction. If Coleridge and the Christian tradition are correct about Logos epistemology, what are truth and beauty, and how does reading fiction bring us closer to a more profound relationship with truth and beauty? Let's start by saying what truth is not. Truth is not information. Truth is not our rational and academic understanding. It's not, in other words, what we spent our high school years and too much of our college time acquiring in classrooms for demonstration on standardized tests and in expository compositions. I offer for your consideration instead <laughs> that truth is the logos to reality that brings everything into existence moment to moment and which reality became man and Jesus of Nazareth. This truth is the ruling power the basileia, the kingdom within us, which we know, by which we know anything through its recognition of its reflection and everything visible and invisible. Keats famously equates truth and beauty because what is beautiful is the revelation in our hearts of this metaphysical ground in the world as far as we know. The world we live in, however, dismisses cardiac experiential truth and beauty as subjective knowledge that because it is qualitative rather than quantifiably measurable is not as sure as the knowledge and elegance of the physical sciences. That basically if you live in a world and you believe that everything is quantities of matter and energy, you know only the least important truths. That all of beauty and knowledge uh, and goodness, which are not quantities of matter and energy, are lost to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> as pervasive as this view is, this materialist view is in a scientific culture that celebrates individualism rather than selflessness and love, rationalism more than noetic knowledge, 
and materialism above spiritual reality, it is nonetheless wrong-headed, even just untrue. A moment's reflection on the degree to which story or narrative consumes our waking and dreaming mental life exposes the folly of the three defining errors of our age, individualism, materialism, and rationalism. I mean, the active faculty in the human person when telling or experiencing story, call it imagination or heart, you know, this faculty is not individual but transpersonal. C.S. Lewis, as I said, calls it conscience to highlight as the word's root reveals, it's being a shared knowing, conscience, right, conscio. And then Greek, it's even more obvious, you know, in sonato, it's a shared vision, conscience. It's not ours, it's, it's, it's a knowledge and a way of seeing that we all share. Whew. Cardiac perception of truth and beauty and becoming it is of a higher order of, order of being than having it as something other be a rational comprehension. The idea that everything real, materialism, is quantifiable mass or energy, that idea itself is offered as an assertion of truth, right? If I say everything is matter and energy, I'm offering that to you as, a, as an assertion of truth. But truth has no quantity of matter and energy. <laughs> so the assertion in itself is an internal contradiction that is absurd, right? Everything is matter and energy, except for the assertion that everything is matter and energy. All right. I mean, um, materialist scientism, in other words, is self-evidently contradictory, even delusional. Experiencing story makes us more human because it liberates the heart from the principial shackles on it of our age and exercises the heart in imaginative experience of truth and beauty what is most real, even eternal, in our transient lives. All right, we'll bring this to a close. The stories of social media, the gossip of news, the violence of computer gaming, the tragedy of pornography and its destruction of the heart, in effect, almost all of the dissipating story that we experience in the cinema and at the computer are spiritually deadening rather than edifying. Whilst, but they satisfy our boundless hunger for story oxygen to exercise our hearts. While doing that, these experiences leave us with a diminished capacity for relationship, sacrificial love, and entry to in what is most real in the created world, truth and beauty. We leave the internet more often than not feeling much like we do after binging on potato chips and soda. We have eaten something that will nourish us, this capacity for story, perhaps our perhaps appease our hunger for food and story temporarily, but in contrast with a satisfying meal of, of whole food prepared by someone we love, we feel shallow, hollow, even sick. I close with the hope that all of you, in as much as you want to be fully human, which is to say eternally alive in Christ, will re-examine your relationship with the internet and its stories and deepen your appreciation and entry into stories that you read in books. Our experiencing truth and beauty in an age of error and perversity largely depends on your watchful regard of what your brain and the mind are becoming by its exercise and focus. And I hope too that one of you at least will remember this talk <laughs> as more than the ravings of an old man, you know, a potter pundit, no less, um, who thought that the internet was like all tools, only as good as its right use, and as dangerous as it invites misuse and abuse. Thank you for your attention, and in advance for writing me with your comments at john at hogwartsprofessor.com via the internet.